What up, y'all? This is your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio, live from Dubai for Thursday, August 20th, 2015, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, or on Twitter at the Enter Report. You can listen to this show anytime you want on iHeartRadio or download any iHeart apps. Search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. The Regal Entertainment Group, the nation's largest movie theater chain, has begun checking moviegoers' bags and purses before allowing them inside the, to watch a film. Regal uh, Entertainment Group wants our customers and staff to feel comfortable and safe when visiting or working in our theaters, the chain said on its website as it began having empl- its employees inspect bags this week. Uh, the statement continued, To ensure the safety of our guests and employees, backpacks and bags are of any kind are subjected to, suspic- to inspection prior to admission. We have acknowledged that this procedure cause, can cause some inconvenience and that it is not without flaws, but hope these are minor in comparison to increased safety. Regal uh, began gradually instituting the policy this week in some of the 569 theaters it operates, which has 7,318 screens. With Regal Cinema and the Edwards and United Artists chains under its edges, Reg has theaters in nearly every state. Regal, based in Knoxville, Tennessee, is the first national cinema chain to start checking backpacks and bags before moviegoers are allowed inside, though some independent chains have experimented with bag checks. Showcase Cinemas, a chain of theaters in Nashville, uh, said it now prohibits backpacks and bags. Packages. Two in- recent incidents have brought movie safety issues to the fore. In July, a gunman killed himself after killing two at a movie theater in Lafayette, Louisiana. And earlier this month in Nashville, Tennessee, a man with- was shot and killed after he attacked moviegoers with pepper spray and a hatchet. Last week, James Holmes was sentenced to life in prison for his 2012 shooting rampage in Aurora, Colorado, which killed 12 people and another 70 injured. A National Association of Theater Owners spokesman contacted the rep, said Wednesday, that the umbrella group representing the chains would have no statement on theater security issues. Exhibitors are reluctant to get into much details on safety measures, concerned about tipping off those who are intent on beating them. Calls to Regal were not immediately returned to on Wednesday, and spokesman for AMC Entertainment and Cinemark Theaters, this nation's second and third largest chains, declined comment as well. It's a complex issue for theater owners and Hollywood. Exhibitors and studios have to balance keeping customers, uh, excuse me, consumer content in an increasingly competitive entertainment market with keeping them safe. It is not clear who's responsible for and best equipped to ensure the safety of moviegoers. Exhibitor Relations Senior Analyst Jeff Box said, Violence is clearly a large issue that affects more than movies. You have to have the same concerns at grocery stores, sporting events. We need a more comprehensive policy, and I think the government is better equipped to come up with, with it than Hollywood studios and movie theaters owners. Cost is a fair too. Security experts have said that the electronic equipment required to make movie theaters as safe as airports could cost more than $1,000 per site, which would be prohibited for many smaller independent theaters and could force them out of business. The majority of moviegoers at theaters with the increased security steps were okay with them, according to media reports from areas at which Regal had begun to check, which are common at concerts and sporting events held in large stadiums. Stephen Lau, a student at Northeastern University, says she generally feels safe at the movies. She told the Boston Herald, I don't walk out of my house thinking that someone is going to shoot me. At the end of the day, it comes down to gun control, but not everyone was happy with the plan. Uh, said one irritated moviegoer outside a Regal Theater in Boston, it's just another way to keep, for them to keep us from bringing our own food in. Former scandal star Columbus Short was in police custody Wednesday night after being arrested by bounty hunters during his album release party at Universal Studio City Walk in Los Angeles a day earlier. Following his arrest, he was held on $250,000 bail at the Men's Center Jail. His rep said he, his arrest was not due to an outstanding warrant, as was erroneously reported. It appears that this is a citizen's arrest as a result of an issue between Mr. Short and his bail bondsman. The rep added Mr. Short was in good standing with the court when he was picked up. It really was just between him and his bail bondsman. Short was due to appear before a judge at 8.30 a.m. Thursday at the LAX Superior Court 
uh, in Los Angeles. However, his attorney Ludwell B. Creary told the rap that Short was expected to post bail before then and in turn will not have to attend the Thursday hearing. Creary said he's in the process of bailing out as we speak. Short, who's 32, was about to go on stage to perform his new music at Universal's Infusion Lounge when men in bulletproof vests with agent embazened on them apprehended him, later handed him over to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department for booking. The arrest was the latest in a series of legal battles involving the embattled actor. In April 2014, he left the hit ABC show Scandal after being charged in a domestic violence case. In December 2014, a judge ruled that Short would stand trial on a felony battery charge stemming from a March brawl in the parking lot of a Los Angeles bar where he was accused of punching Fenton Hitch. Hitch suffered a concussion and a fractured eye socket, according to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. If convicted, Short faces up to four years in prison in the case. A federal judge has ordered a $20 billion racial discrimination lawsuit against Al Sharpton's National Action Network, Comcast, and Time Warner Cable be reopened less than two weeks after it was dismissed. Judge Terry Hatter issued a ruling Wednesday reopening the suit filed by Barry and Allen's Entertainment Studio Networks, Inc. and the National Association of African American Owned Media. Um, Allen, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Entertainment Studios, said in a statement to the rep, we will not stop until this discrimination stops and we and we achieve uh, true uh, economic inclusion. Mark DeVitri, the president of NAAAOM, continued, We will continue to vigorously pursue Comcast and Time Warner Cable, who spends approximately $25 billion annually licensing cable networks with less than $3 million going to 100% African-American-owned media. The lawsuit, which, was also, uh, which also named the NAACP, was filed and made by the National Association of African-American-Owned Media and Entertainment Studio Networks. The co-plaintiffs claimed that the defendants were blocking equal access for black own networks. It states that the group collaborated to make Comcast NBC Universal appear to fight for diversity, but instead keep 100% black owned networks out of the mix. One of the payoffs the plaintiffs allege was the MSNBC show Sharpton hosts, which they say MSNBC owner Comcast gave to Sharpton in exchange for his signatures on diversity agreements. The suit reads, Comcast spent millions of dollars to pay non-media civil rights groups to support its acquisition of NBC Universal while at the same time refusing to do business with 100% African American owned media companies, the suit reads. These payments were a, a ruche made with the ulter, ulterior motive to make Comcast look like a good corporate citizen while it steadfastly uh, refused to contact contract with 100% African American owned channels. Uh, Louis R. Skip Miller, partner at Miller uh, Barrandess LLP and lead attorney for the plaintiff, said Wednesday, I have always believed in this historic case. I am confident we will prevail. Judge Hatter concluded on the August 7th that the plaintiffs have failed to allege any plausible claim for relief, but now he has given them a second chance. They have until September 21st, 2015, in which to file an amended complaint. After becoming a worldwide trending topic on Twitter, these nuts, the independent candidate, has been identified as ineligible to run. Sadly, these nuts will have to pull out of the U.S. presidential race prematurely. The independent candidate from Iowa, who's currently polling at 9% in North Carolina, has been found. But according to the Daily Beast, he's a 15-year-old high school student named Brady Olson. The, ki- the teenager was apparently inspired to declare his candidacy when he learned of a Louisiana cat that had joined the race. Olson told the, ta- the Daily Beast, when I heard about the Limbutt McCubbins story, I realized I could. Olson filed his official paperwork with the Federal Elections Commission on July 26 as these nuts. According to a public policy polling uh, survey released Wednesday, one in 10 North Carolina voters would pick for him in a race between nuts, Donald Trump, and Hillary Clinton. After he started polling at 8% in Iowa and 9% in North Carolina, these nuts began to trend worldwide on Twitter. But according to the U.S. Constitution, the presidency and vice presidency are restricted to native U.S. citizens at least 35 years of age. Despite the constitutional obstacles, Olson insisted that he is not giving up his dream to become the first 15-year-old uh, president of the United States. Olson said the next step is to get some party nominations like the Minnesota Independent Party or the Modern Whig Party. It would be great to find a VP, preferably McCubbins, because the Nuts McCubbins ticket sounds amazing. 
Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump says the controversy surrounding Hillary Clinton's email use as Barack Obama's Secretary of State is devastating for the election. In an interview with CNN's Chris Cuomo on Wednesday, the business mogul term politician added, but I think her bigger problem is not the election. I think her bigger problem is going to be the criminal problem. The GOP frontrunner added that he is not surprised that he has come within six points of the former Secretary of State in the latest polls. I think Hillary is going to have a hard time being in the election based on what's going on with the emails, the servers, maybe even the speeches, he said. I think it's going to be a very hard thing for her to overcome. He compared Clinton to General David uh, Petraeus, the former four-star Army general and CIA director who pleaded guilty in January to one misdemeanor charge of mishandling classified information in his dealings with his biographer and lover. Trump said, when I look, Chris, at what happened to Petraeus, Great general, wonderful guy, everybody loved him, and it destroyed his life over much less. It would seem hard to think that somebody could have a much worse situation than him and escape. Trump also responded to pundits who criticized him for telling me the press moderator, Chuck Todd, on Sunday that he often gets military strategy by watching current and retired generals on TV. Trump says, I watch your show and I watch other shows and you have the best channels, the best of everything. Frankly, probably better than I could get. What do I know? I'm a man that made a great fortune. I'm going to make our country rich, and I'm going, I'm going to make our country great. Rosie O'Donnell is furious with the man who was discovered with her 17-year-old daughter after, he, after her recent disappearance and wants the world to know of his criminal past and drug history. The former View host posted a photo of the 25-year-old Steve Shearer on Wednesday along with the caption, charged with third-degree possession of heroin with the intent to distribute. She, wanted on, she went on to post links for and retweet news reports detailing his arrest. Shear was arrested and charged with third-degree heroin possession in March 2012. Lieutenant uh, Keith German of the Beringat Police Department told the rep. He has been uh, arrested on numerous occasions over the years, including for drug possession, driving under the influence, and disorderly conduct, Lieutenant German said. Chelsea O'Donnell was found at Shear's home in Beringat, New Jersey, Tuesday following her disappearance with her dog, Bear, on August 11th from the family home in Nyack, New York. Lieutenant German says, in this case, we didn't have any evidence to substantiate criminal charges. Stating Chelsea was cooperative and friendly, she will not held against her will. There was no indication that drugs were involved and no paraphernalia was found at the house. It has been reported that the teenager met Shearer on the dating app Tinder. Rosie posted a series of tweets about Shearer on Wednesday, including the confession that no mom is perfect and the pledge, when someone you love is drowning in the rapids, you throw everything you can into the water hoping they will grab on, stay afloat. In March 2012, Shearer and Emily Lloydis were both arrested after being stopped with heroin and drug paraphernalia in their car, along with Lloydis' three- and one-year-old child children in the back seat, according to the Baron Gat patch. Both were held $75,000 bail and charged with possession of heroin and endangering the welfare of Lloydis' children. Chelsea O'Donnell is the oldest of three children that Rosie had with ex- Kelly Carpenter. At the time of her disappearance, O'Donnell said that her daughter had stopped taking medication and was in need of medical attention. Music journalist Dee Barnes is speaking out about the, uh, the attack that she said she suffered at the hands of Dr. Dre in the 90s. Barnes reflected on the incident for Gawker after watching Straight Outta Compton. She noted that the NWO biopic leaves out the brutality she and other women allegedly suffered at the hands of Dre. The incident involved Barnes occurred in 1991 at a Hollywood re record release party. Dre was angry about a report by Barnes on the Fox show Pump It Up that included a clip of Ice Cube, who recently departed NWA insulting his former bandmates. Dre allegedly tried to choke Barnes down a flight of stairs, choked her, and pinned her to the floor to the women's bathroom with his knee on her chest. Barnes eventually settled out of court with Dre over the incident. Dre also pleaded no contest to assault and served two years probation. Um... Barnes wrote, that event isn't depicting in Straight Outta Compton, but I don't think it should have been either. The truth is too ugly for a general audience. I didn't want to see a depiction of me getting beat up, just like I didn't want to see a depiction of Dre beating up uh, Michelle, his one-time girlfriend, recently summed up their relationship this way. I was just a quiet girlfriend who got beat on and told to sit down and shut up. But what should have been addressed is that it occurred. 
Barnes went on to write that the film should have been addressed to the number of women Dre has been accused of assaulting, including Michelle and Tyree B., whom he alleges who he allegedly assaulted at a Grammys party in 1990. Barnes wrote in his lyrics, Dre made hyperbolic claims about all these heinous things he did to women, but then he went out and actually violated women. Dre out of Compton would have would have you believe that he really he didn't really do that. It doesn't add up. Barnes noted that Strata Compton director F. Gary Gray was her pump it up uh, cameraman, so he was behind the scenes for the segment that apparently led to Dre's desire to attack. Barnes has suffered chronic migraines since the attack and has effectively been blacklisted from music journalism because people fear hurting their relationship with Dre. Barnes goes on to write that she auditioned for a part in Gray's 1996 drama Set It Off, but that Gray said he wouldn't hire her because he wanted to cast Dre in the movie. Barnes wrote, the biggest problem with Straight Outta Compton is that it ignores several NWA's own harsh realities. Reps for Gray and Dre's production company did not immediately respond for request for comment. Four-time Grammy winner, uh, excuse me, four-time Grammy winner Lionel Richie will be feted as the 2016 Music Cares Person of the Year by the Recording Academy. So far, confirmed tributes concert performers include Grammy winners Lady Antebellum and Pharrell Williams, along with Luke Bryan. Additional additional performers will be announced shortly. American Idol music director Ricky Minor will spearhead the tributes program as musical director. Set for February 13, 2016 in L.A., two days before the Grammys, the 26th annual gala dinner and concert benefits Music Care, which provides financial, medical, and personal support for musicians in needs. In making the announcement, the Academy noted that Richie has been tapped in recognition of his significant creative accomplishments as well as his career-spanning charitable work, which, rain, which has included support from an impressive range of causes over the year, ranging from AIDS and human rights to famine, poverty, human trafficking, and women's issues, and for contributing to the United Negro College Fund. Say Neil Portnow, President and CEO of Music Cares Foundation and the Recording Academy, it's truly a privilege to be paying tribute to Lionel, whose musical gifts and philanthropy have touched millions of people around the world. At a Bill Silva, the chair of the Music Cares Foundation Board, Lionel's artistry is a genuine blend of emotional connection and point lyricism and we look forward to a truly magical evening that will highlight his astonishing and inspiring body of work in a, in a statement Richie calls the honor a top of the mountain morning a moment. As far as I'm concerned, this is the highest honor in our music business because it means you have a career, says Richie, who has sold more than 100 million albums and won an Oscar. You survived the journey, if you will. The people who have been there defied characters. When you say Barbara Streisand, Bob Dylan, and Paul McCartney, are you kidding me? When I got into this business, I wanted to be like them. When you get recognized like this, it's everything. Music Care Grammy Foundation VP Dana Tamarkin says the Music Cares Gala is a significant fundraising source that continues to grow each year. Thanks to the leadership of Neil Portnow and the support of the Academy trustees as a whole, they provide all the financial support for our overhead and staff so that every dollar we generate in our fundraising efforts goes out to our programs. Tar, uh, Tar Markin says, adding that the 2016 event will be a high energy night courtesy of Richie and his fans and supporters. He's so personal and his music creates such energy that I'm looking forward to that kind of level of entertainment. Nobody will walk away disappointed. Also not disappointing, Music Care's charitable efforts. Direct financial assistant grants hit a landmark in 2015 with $4.3 billion serving more than 4,300 clients in need. And now here are the top 10 songs on the Billboard Hot 100 singles charts for the week of August 29th. Number 10, Selena Gomez featuring ASAP Rocky with Good For You. Number 9, Taylor Swift featuring Kendrick Lamar with Bad Blood. Number 8, Fetty Wap featuring Monty with My Way. Number 7, Fetty Wap with Trap Queen. Number 6, Rachel Platten with Fight Song. Number 5, The Weeknd with The Hills. Number 4, Major Lazer featuring DJ Snake and featuring M.O. with Lean On. Number 3, Salento with Watch Me. Number 2, The Weeknd with Can't Feel My Face. And again, the number 1 song on the Billboard Hot 100 singles charts is Omi with Cheerleader.
And now let's look back at what happened on this date in entertainment history. On this day, 1977, Best of My Love by the Emotions hits the top of the U.S. pop charts. As children, they called themselves the Heavenly Sunbeams, and no name could have been more appropriate to their sound. Their smash hit, Best of My Love, which topped the Billboard pop chart on this date in 1977, was one of the biggest, most Spine tinkling hits of the disco era, and it came from a group whose core values could have been more different from the hedonism of that era since it has come to symbolize. The Emotions was a family act in the true sense. Under the music guidance of their father, Joseph, sisters Sheila, Wanda, and Jeanette Hutchinson began performing publicly while still in grade school. From their earliest performances at the Mount Sinai Baptist Church on the south side of their native Chicago in the late 50s, they worked their way up and onto the national gossip circuit in the 1960s where they met and impressed the staple singers, the famous gospel group that had recently made the crossover to secular soul and R&B. The former Heavenly Sunbeams became the Emotions when they made a similar move in 1968, signing with the Memphis-based Stax Records, the, sa the same label that was home to the staple singers. With the help of producer-songwriter Isaac Hayes, the Emotions scored several moderate R&B hits over the next seven years, including one So I Can Love You that reached the pop top 40, and another Blind Alley that would later be sampled as the basis of Mariah Carey's massive 1993 hit Dream Lover. During these years, the group featured a rotation, a rotating cast of Hutchinson sisters, always with Sheila, Wanda, and Jeanette as the core, but with sister Pamela or the close family Teresa Davis filling in whenever one of the others was out of the maternity leave. When Stax Records folded in 1975, the Hutchinson sisters began working with Maurice White of Earth, Wind, and Fire, and this was the, the collaboration that would lead them to their greatest commercial success, not only on the not only with the number one song topped. Uh, the charts, excuse me, on this date in 1977, but also with the top 10 smash Boogie Wonderland, a 1979 duet between The Emotions and Earth, Wind and & Fire. And as your entertainment report for Thursday, August 20th, 2015, I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back tomorrow to wrap up the week, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash The Entertainment Report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O. Or on Twitter at The Enter Report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of the Entertainment Report anytime you want on iHeartRadio or download any of the iHeart apps. Search for the Entertainment Report and it'll take you to the page. Good night and God bless you all.